I'm going to talk a bit about Busan, actually, because I want to situate what's happening in terms of the Canadian aid program in, in the broader sense of what's happening to the cooperation, uh, international cooperation at this moment, and then focus in much more on uh, some of the challenges for our sector and for some of the challenges particularly created by uh, CETA's current policies and the most recent federal budget. The contrast between the meeting in Accra in 2008 and the meeting in Busan in 2011 was stark uh, for many reasons. In uh, Accra, in Ghana, the world came together to follow up on the Paris Principles, which was an agreement among the donor countries, the club, about rules and behavior that would create a foundation for more effective aid. What happened in Accra was that that conversation that had been created, you know, archetypally in Paris within the elite had a much more broad airing and critique and transformation because it was determined in Accra that civil society were an important actor in the development process, that they had an autonomous role as civil society. They weren't just there as people to deliver government programs or they just weren't there as people to receive government programs, that they were an actor in development. And Canada and Sweden, with some support from some other uh, European countries played a critical leadership role in framing the discussion in Accra, in making some progress in recogni recognizing gender equality and human rights as part of the underpinning for human development. Fast forward three years to Busan, and the landscape is fundamentally different. In the first instance, the usual suspects are missing in action. Um, it is usually the Europeans who are in, in the leadership role in framing the, uh, the, 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 the thinking and discourse around development and uh, development cooperation. But Europe is totally lost in its own little internal Eurozone uh, uh, economic meltdown, political crisis, trying to figure out where they're going and how they're going right now. So, uh, Literally, uh, you went days without hearing anyone from Europe say anything that was important in this session. You had the United States that stepped up to the plate to some extent to fill a bit of that void, but that quite frankly, until the election is over, the only thing that really matters for them is who's ahead in Wisconsin and in Nevada, and they're, they're totally tied up in their little internal dynamic. And then you had the, the, the most important actors at the table. All of the discussion really revolved around the private sector. And part of the irony in this conversation is that there were about 3,000 people in Busan. There were about 12 representatives of corporations. They didn't have to be represented in person because they were very, very ably represented by the governments of the North uh, who came together to ensure that the final agreement in Busan, for example, that makes one reference to human rights has four references to public-private partnerships. And to you know, rethink uh, the way that we deliver global aid in such a way that we increasingly place the market and major multinational corporations as critical actors in the delivery of aid. Another part of the dynamic there, as I said, was then the strategy about how you engage the new cooperation actors, uh, China in particular. Uh, but also India and Mexico and South Africa and Brazil. And this was uh, a sorry tale whereby all of the conversations were about we want China to sign on and there's no price too high to get China's signature. Therefore, anytime you wanted to be more proactive about human rights, anytime you wanted to be more proactive about citizen participation, anytime you wanted to be more proactive about accountability, they would say, well, no, no, but we have to lower the, you know, if, 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 if we put that language in, China won't sign on. All of that said, there were some positive things that happened in Busan. One was that the uh, recipient countries were better organized than they've ever been. Rwanda in particular played an exceptional role in being very consistent, very well organized, uh, and very articulate in framing some very clear expectations about compliance and change behaviors. Really pushing, for example, uh, national systems and national standards and national procurement. 
which the United States was adamant that they would avoid duck, uh, find fudge language for, and in the end, not to say that they won't undermine it or ignore it, but Rwanda's position on behalf of the African Union prevailed. What I would say is that the, the Busan process at this time uh, suffered greatly from, number one, the fact that we're sort of in the era of the G0, and I've, a number of you have heard me refer to this term. The G0 in that, you know, while we talk about the G8 and we talk about the G20, we're really dealing in a world in which there's a vacuum of leadership. And the void then is being filled not by the G20, but by the B20. You know, the business leaders that come together parallel to the G20. And all of that, of course, situated in, the, in a context in which the discussion of international cooperation is increasingly a sideshow. And I mean, those of us who work in this, we, we appreciate how absolutely critically important international cooperation, international aid is, but we also realize that it is not the central change that has to happen if we're going to deal fundamentally with the challenges that are confronting this time. Right? Busan, while it's framed as an agreement for governments and a challenge to governments and the donor countries to be more transparent and accountable and effective, in the aid that they're supporting, and to the recipient countries in being more accountable to their own citizens for how those dollars are being spent. It's also uh, a reminder how much of it is a challenge to our sector and our business model of the sector. Right? Because when we talk about NGOs, that includes the good, the bad, and the ugly. And there are lots of NGOs that are represented in those fora that continue to have a business model and a development model that is anti-development and needs to end. You know, governments of the South are very clear that Technical cooperation is not something they're particularly uh, enthusiastic about. You know, when they want someone, they'll call you, but don't send people our way that we haven't invited. Is their message? Right? Even for organizations in the north that that have a, have a rights-based analysis and that have a commitment to advocacy, uh, you know, it's sometimes a challenge to make room for the fact that the voices the, the South has their own voice. Thank you. We can support that. We can encourage that. We can echo that. Uh, but we can't substitute our voice for that voice. You know, one of the basic underpinnings of quality aid is predictability. If we're going to have southern ownership, if we're going to uh, empower governments in the south to identify their priorities, develop a coherent plan, and put together both their domestic resources and their aid funding into a coherent package that will advance that plan, they need to be able to know from one day to the other where their money's come, coming from. It means if you have short-term money, you build schools. If you have long-term money, you build an education system. If you have short-term money, you buy medicines or you, you build a clinic. If you have long-term long money, you start training nurses. Right? And so they need to know what Canada is doing. It is really important that we help Canadians distinguish between what Canada is doing, as in the state and the government, and what Canadians are doing, as in citizens who share our values, share our interests, and share our commitments, right? And uh, assert the importance of active citizenship and effective states within this country, just as we do globally. We need to be making the connections, uh, helping people understand the big picture, and helping them understand the big picture not only within Canada, uh, but globally. So I'll leave it at that and take any questions.